so that was a great introduction, and um, now we can all go. No. Um, so what we're going to do is provide some cultural context. So uh, why are we bringing together these interdisciplinary teams that Jatin was talking about um, um, around cultural solutions for our energy landscapes? Um, so Robert will begin, and then I'll start talking about some of the models within which we work. So the context of the Land Art Generator Initiative is really um, uh, we're doing our part as architect, artist, designer to address climate change. Um, you know, scientists have been telling us since the 70s and even those who worked for Exxon at the time that we have to do something, that this is a real problem. Yet 2017, we put out 1.4% more carbon into the atmosphere than we did in 2016. And 20 18, we're on track to do the same. Um, the recent report from the IPCC is yet another stark reminder that we are not acting and we need to act. Um, we need to start decommissioning uh, fossil facilities, um, but yet still we're commissioning them. So what is the hang up? Why uh, can't uh, civilization wrap its collective mind around this and, and actually take the action that's necessary. There are a lot of reasons for that, but the one that we're focusing on is that we seem to lack the cultural will to do so, and this is a cultural problem. These, um, these continued communications of the dire apocalyptic consequences that will come to us and our future generations to not acting, rising sea levels, heat map projections, mass extinctions, droughts, major weather events increasing. Um, they are important to communicate, and they have done their job very well. Um, however, at some point, they, they, they tend to cause the, the human brain to sort of shut down, and we crawl into our shell, and we just think, oh my god, this is the future that we're resigned to. We, we, there's nothing that I can personally do about this. And what we fail to see is that what really drives human motivation and action and political will is a, to, to be presented with a new and better world, a vision for the future that we can desire, that we can want to have. I mean, Madison Avenue has figured this out, so why can't um, the uh, global community around the science of climate? And so we're trying to do what we can to bring renewable energy more into the front of popular culture through art and design. We're bringing together interdisciplinary teams. We're learning from what we've accomplished in living building design. We're, we're recognizing that the technology already exists. And yesterday, we were reminded of that, that the work continues. And we keep getting marginally more improvement on the efficiencies and cost of these technologies. But we can do it today if we had the desire to do it, if we had the collective will that we had at, in the face of the threats of World War II. Uh, the world came together. Uh, we didn't ask. Um, you know, questions about uh, how much does it cost. We just did it uh, because it's an investment um, in the future. So if you go back to the beginning of electrification, you'll find that all of our power plants were designed to be in the hearts of our cities. So people had a, a, an immediate connection to where their energy came from. These coal-fired and gas-fired power plants were designed by architects of the time to fit in with the, the beauty of the, 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 the city and the normative aesthetics of architects, architecture and art of the day, so much so that those that have been decommissioned because they were very polluting, and as soon as we could get them out of the city, we did, uh, have been readapted into other uses, like the Tate Modern is a perfect example, but many of these are now condominiums, et cetera, because the shells are gorgeous. Um, they had a connection to art and architecture. But as we were able to raise the voltage and transmit electricity more efficiently across long distances, we got these away from the places that we live and work, and they lost their relationship to art and to architecture. They became pure utility. There was no um, immediate need to have this cultural connection. And so now everyone uh, has very little understanding of exactly where the electrons that they flip the switch on on the wall, where those come from. Um, and in the renewable energy infrastructure that we're building today, that 
connection to culture, to art and architecture, is still disconnected. It's, it's been lost. And in some cases, that is being used as a tool for not in my backyard arguments. Uh, just today, there's news about there are wind towers being taken down that were just installed a year and a half ago in Iowa because the community has taken them to court. Now, talk about um, doing the wrong thing in terms of carbon footprint. All that embodied energy that went into the construction and installation of those turbines is now being, I don't know where they're going to end up, if they'll be able to be used somewhere else or not, but it's definitely going the wrong direction. Um, so how do we bring art and culture back into the imagining of our renewable energy landscapes, and how do we inspire the general public about the beauty of a post-carbon culture of stewardship? How do we create that culture today so that our actions can be reflective of that? So we, uh, you know, tackled with these ideas. We thought, well, what if we put out a call to interdisciplinary teams? And what would it look like if engineers were sitting down with creatives and really trying to troubleshoot this? Um, and we've now held five international design competitions as our response to this challenge. Um, every two years, we put out a call to people around the world. It's a free competition. We work with different sites around the world. And really pleased to say that we have nearly 1,000 ideas sitting in a portfolio that represent um, probably well over 70 countries at this point. Um, and what we're talking about here are uh, large-scale public artworks that, yes, generate kilowatt hours of electricity, but at the same time really drive economic development, tourism, and STEAM education. And we will talk about some of that STEAM education is, uh, towards the end of these, the presentation. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the economic benefit of public art. Um, so this is a project that is not one of our projects. It's uh, artwork that was up in New York City for four months called New York City Waterfalls and cost $15.5 million to install. Um, but it's estimated that that brought in $53 million in incremental spending. So there's really a strong case for the economic benefit of public art in cities around the world, and especially these high profile and uh, rather expensive pieces of public art. So what you're going to see in a few minutes is our response to what that could look like is, uh, you know, public art that's also generating utility scale clean energy. Uh, we started the project in Dubai because we were based there and inspired by the landscape and held our first competition in 2010. There were three sites, all urban gateways, one in Dubai, two in Abu Dhabi, and uh, pleased to have been supported by Mazdar, who put us front and center at the 2010 World Future Energy Summit. So this uh, put us immediately in the face of the energy sector. In 2012, we shifted site typologies and went to a uh, former land Fresh Kills Park at one time was the Fresh Kills Landfill, three times the size of Central Park now as a reclamation project. So a real amenity for New Yorkers and a terrific canvas for our teams. In 2014, we were at a brownfield site. Just across from the Little Mermaid is an old shipyard. So again, we're shifting our site typologies and encouraging our teams to deal with um, the conditions and challenges of different sites and cities. In 2016, we were in Santa Monica at a coastal site just off from the Santa Monica Pier. Um, so our teams had the opportunity to use technologies that they could not in past competitions, including wave and tidal. But at the same time, uh, they were addressing the drought condition of uh, South, Southern California at the time. We've just closed off Loggy 2018 Melbourne, uh, so we were in Australia this year, supported by the state of Victoria, for a site that's uh, near the beach, St. Kilda Triangle, and this was quite unique in our portfolio uh, because it's a site that is, has gone through two master planning stages in the last several years. Um, so it's a very important site for the community and for Melbourne. It's a very political site and challenging because we really had to work with local community in a way that, uh, that was exciting and important um, to really propel a project forward. 
Okay, we're going to go through just a few of the submissions, and Robert can't help himself when talking about the technology, so he's going to give you some great descriptions of the technology and uh, some of the artworks that are in response. I'll be brief, and uh, because this audience, you already know about the technology. Um, obviously, you've got some standard blue solar panels, the kind that if you close your eyes and you think solar panel, this is probably what pops up first to the front of your mind. And uh, if you give these to a team of artists and engineers working together, you get energy duck. So everybody loves a duck, and so why not have it power a neighborhood is the question here. It also is interesting because it is a battery. It allows water to fill the hole of the duck. It's duck belly uh, in a controlled way through uh, small turbines that create a additional electricity. And then that water can be pumped back out. So um, it addresses the duck curve for renewable energy. So it's a way to educate the public about the potential for in, in interesting storage technologies um, and so that they can learn about the duck curve, uh, but also it's a really great way to engage young people in understanding the potential for solar technology in different applications. Night and Day is the second place winner of the 2018 competition, and it is also doing a similar thing, celebrating the release of water from this, uh, I don't know, do I have a, yeah. So here is a storage container that's made out of uh, semi-translucent material. Water during the day um, is, there's a large array of solar modules that are hidden from this view here that face north there. And they, throughout the day, put electricity into the grid, but some portion is used to pump water into this container. And then in the evening, when the electricity demand spikes, the water is released and, and flows through Pelton turbines down this channel here. And the public can come out and sort of watch this daily event as an activity. So it's a way to think about how do we engage the public in a really visceral way um, with these technologies. And I'd like to take a moment here to remind everybody that the goal for all of these artworks is not the cheapest kilowatt hour. It's not efficiency per se, because these are first and foremost works of public art. Cities are building works of public art every day uh, that don't generate any electricity. Um, we're challenging this world and this culture to think about what if we use these technologies into these artworks that make our cities more vibrant and livable at the same time as they make them more sustainable. And this may help to contribute to the proliferation of the more utilitarian and, and, um, and, and cost per kilowatt hour designed installations elsewhere around us. But you don't have to limit yourself to the flat blue solar panels that come to mind uh, when you think about solar. This is an example of a tinted polycrystalline module and a laminated solar panel. So. Um, there, again, is some slight efficiency loss with some of these technologies, but it's very minimal. And the value of having this versatility to use this as a medium for creative expression and in new and exciting ways is, is very great because you can have these technologies weave themselves into pl public spaces where they could normally not otherwise go. Here you have the photovoltaic sun of the solar ecosystem in the center surrounded by the planets. It is made out of that gold-tinted polycrystalline module and custom cell shapes to create this arabesque sphere. Um, it's beautiful, blingy. Who wouldn't want this in the heart of their city? And it generates enough power to um, electrify 100 homes. The position of the planets around that sun are, is the relative position of the planets on the day that the UAE was founded. So it's a, an homage to that young country and their pride. So. You have here that laminated technology. So these yellow ribbons are all photovoltaic cells. And they create sort of a, an, a stream of energy flowing down from a new hotel that's planned to be placed behind the Palais Theater in St. Kilda Triangle. And they cover uh, an existing highway called Jacka Boulevard, which today separates this triangle, this very important space in the city, from the water in the foreshore from 
pedestrians aren't able to make that connection very easily. So it spans as kind of a cap park of energy to create this continuous public amenity in that space. And this is the winner of the 2018 competition. Hopefully, uh, within the next 10 years, this will be I actually just want to point out the team uh, for this particular uh, submission, because it's a great example of what we invite and our greatest ambition with the project is this level of interdisciplinarity. So you see um, an architecture firm. There is um, ARC Resources. Uh, John Bahoric Design and RMIT architecture students. So, you know, the, the architecture firm really reached out and brought a lot of people to the table to help work on this project. Yeah. Moving on to the next generation of solar, you've got your dye sensitized solar cells, organic photovoltaics, and these are really interesting because, from an artistic perspective, they are any color of the rainbow, semi-translucent potentially if you use a clear substrate. And they can be used in any number of interesting ways. All of the pink ribbon that you see here proposed in this artwork is the organic photovoltaic material itself. So this is obviously the kind of power plant where you want to take your family for a picnic, not like the images we showed at the beginning of the lecture. Um, solar thermal. This is a uh, prototype of a beam down solar power tower. So you're all familiar with the solar power towers that are going up in the deserts around the world and the American Southwest for sure um, lately and a couple just commissioned for Australia. These are massive arrays of mirrors that follow the sun to focus the energy onto a collector at the top of the tower. Uh, when we learned about these in 2008, it was one of the driving things that kind of sparked our imagination to start the Land Art Generator Initiative because inspired by the tradition of land art in the American Southwest and then seeing these things going up, they seemed almost like unintentional works of land art, thousands of mirrors in the desert focusing beams of light. And so that sort of got us thinking, well, what if we did this more with more intention? This particular prototype is using the set of mirrors at the top of the tower to beam down to the collector so you don't have to pump the heat transfer fluid to the top of the tower. And it's the same idea that's in the winning design for the 2014 competition. It's a solar hourglass to remind us all that there's still time to avert the worst effects of climate change if we can act together collectively. So again, it's an inspiring message about the beauty of our post-carbon future. It happens to also power a thousand homes and it engages the public with this technology. You can walk up to that beam of light and protected by a structural glass cylinder, of course, they don't burn your arm off, but you can touch that glass and you can feel that heat and really understand the technology, be one with it and have a cultural connection to where our energy comes from. Another solar thermal installation proposed for the 2018 competition. Sun Ray is using linear Fresnel reflectors, which is kind of the same idea, but in a more linear approach rather than a nodal approach, um, and um, kind of also related in a way technologically to the parabolic troughs, but spanning over a <laughs> wide area that allows it to be, become this nice solar um, shade over the top of um, St. Kilda Triangle Park. Other technologies, um, this is a company out of Japan that has been working on this for quite a while. They're taking a little too long for our taste, but uh, we do have some samples from them. Um, and they are um, making small devices now out of this. What they're doing is they're taking the waste dust from the production of solar cells where you slice through the ingot of silicon. And they're taking that waste product through this interesting manufacturing process, they're turning it into these teeny tiny beads that are woven together, um, kind of like candy on a conveyor belt, in, into these modules that can be encased in glass and perhaps even in fabric. And so you can imagine the, the opportunities that come with this. PV dust is taking those cells and they're encrusting them onto what they're calling hosts, these white spheres that atomize the ground plane up into the sky so that you can actually increase the surface area of solar collection over what you would have if you placed panels on the ground. 
by about 30 percent. So you're creating more area for solar collection, but you're freeing the ground plane for other uses at the same time as you're creating this incredible pattern in the sky that as you were walking or, or, or traveling underneath it would um, create these interesting patterns. Moving from solar entirely into wind, these are uh, some photos of compact acceleration wind turbines, which take advantage of the Venturi effect, where any fluid, when it's concentrated, will flow more quickly. At, right at the rotor, these lenses do that. However, in the marketplace, this has had a bit of a rough ride because the lens itself is a lot of material and is expensive to make. And if you just make the blades a little longer and get rid of the lens, you actually can make more energy for less money. Um, so this may not be the future of wind power, I don't know, but if you take that same idea and you bring it into the realm of public art, you no longer have to worry about that efficiency as much. You can see here these landforms are actually doing that same thing on the top of one of the mounds at Fresh Kills Park in New York City. These will channel the wind into these landforms, increase its velocity before they hit the rotor in the center. And if you look at this from the sky, it's an actual diagram of the wind rows for that site with the larger, one, larger landforms and turbines facing the prevailing wind direction. Piezoelectric stacked actuators, linear alternators. We put out a field guide to renewable energy that tells uh, these teams about uh, all sorts of technologies that can cleanly convert natural energy and harness that energy and convert it into electricity. Um, and so you can see that some ideas like wind stock come out of that. And this is taking piezoelectric actuators and carbon fiber stalks that are sort of functioning the way that a, a a field of grass blades waves in the wind and a larger scale so you can actually walk through this grass field as if you're an insect uh, or a flea on someone's scalp maybe, I don't know, but uh, underneath the ground you have these linear alternators capturing that back and flow energy and converting into electricity. These can be placed very close together uh, whereas horizontal axis wind turbines, turbines must be placed much further apart from each other. So the energy density per land surface area may be similar, of course uh, not as efficient in terms of cost, but it's art. This is an example of point absorber wave energy devices being used as the media for public art. And uh, in 2016 in Santa Monica, we were able to take advantage of actual wave energy and tidal energy. So this is an example, uh, it's, it's, it's reminding visitors in, in Santa Monica of the fact that the pier used to be a yacht harbor back before the, the Second World War. And so it's hearkening back to that aesthetic and creating this place for people to engage with the technology. And these are actually pretty um, great at, at generating electricity. The pipe is recognizing that water equals energy in places like Southern California where so much electricity is used to pump water over mountains uh, and desalination is more and more on the, in the conversation and it's very energy intense. So the pipe is this new work of public art for the Santa Monica Bay which uses these sleek solar panels all along its skin to power electromagnetic desal desalination. It's designed by an engineering firm in Vancouver, Kalili Engineers, whose bread and butter is water uh, treatment. So they know their stuff. They've designed this in collaboration with the artist, architect. And what's interesting about this is that there's in the center this beautiful uh, pool that's a public amenity. People can go out there and they can lay in this very high saline pool, which is taking some of the waste brine from the desalination process and placing it in a holding tank so that it can be slowly mixed with the surrounding water and released in a way that mitigates the environmental impacts uh, typical of desalination technology. And that's a quick run through of some of the very large, ambitious projects that come out of our biennial design competition, which is blue sky, big ideas, very large sites, thousands of homes powered by these artworks. But we also work at much smaller scales, too, because it's important that we engage local communities in the design of their own energy infrastructures. And so the Solar Mural Art Program is an example of that. This is a piece that was designed by a local artist in San Antonio called La Menarca. It is 
um, reminding people about the threats to the monarch butterfly, but it's also talking about um, the migration patterns of animals and humans across borders as the monarch is very representat representative of that. And it is using the special film to create artwork on top of the panel. There's about a 2% efficiency loss in the conversion efficiency, but but what a trade-off, because now you can place solar panels on the sides of buildings, west-facing buildings that have free access to sun are perfect for this, because they'll generate electricity towards the evening when the demand is getting high. And you no longer have to uh, paint your mural on the side of a building. Artists who want to tell a story and engage with the public can now do that onto panels that'll generate electricity for 30 years, um, rather than chipping paint on the side of a building. Um, and what we have found over the last few years uh, as these terrific submissions come in and we build the portfolio and build the numbers of people around the idea is that it really uh, feeds itself into STEAM programming for young people. Um, this is an example of a camp that we held in 2015 for a group of kids um, age 8 to 17 um, who we took on field trips to a nuclear plant, to a coal-fired plant, and then we offset that with sustainable installations around western Pennsylvania. And I uh, gave them a lot of lessons in energy science, art outside of the gallery, you know, very robust uh, programming that then led them to design and um, help to build a solar sculpture that is feeding into a community center in their neighborhood. So um, this was a six-week camp, but we also see the benefit of running shorter camps with, say, a solar mural as the outcome. We're working with communities around the world well outside of uh, the international competitions. So uh, we're uh, working with a group of Maasai women in Alorgaseli, Kenya, who uh, invited us uh, because they currently have no electricity. Um, and their needs are quite modest. Um, they, uh, this particular group of women, uh, walk uh, maybe an hour and a half to go charge their cell phones that they have to pay for. So it's really just some modest needs. And they are now uh, designing some solutions that will be placed within um, their village. And this is a pretty interesting conversation, actually. You're about to. Oh, no, I think you're getting that. Uh, so in, in this area, there are a lot of renewable energy installations. So there's wind, uh, you know, wind plants coming into the region, solar plants. But what's happening is that they are um, cutting off traditional grazing paths, as a for example. Um, they are taking up the land, traditional land of the Maasai, but none of this is feeding back to benefit the Maasai. Um, and this is a story that we're seeing in uh, indigenous groups around the world. So in the United States, certainly with the Navajo Nation, which we'll be hearing more from Bitta about next week in New York. Um, so, uh, so, you know, how do we uh, bridge this gap? How, you know, what are the solutions? And what was really interesting, Jatine, we were at a conference at ASU a couple months ago, Arizona State University, and one of the big takeaways from that conference is how important it is to remember that all communities um, have different needs and uh, need to be communicated with when these energy installations are coming in. So uh, there are issues around installations where there is, uh, th there's no one to, uh, who's been trained to take care of installations, as a for example. So installations end up not being used or uh, sitting and, um, you know, the problems pile up. So this is a particular project where we're trying to uh, work on the front end um, and, uh, you know, problem solved before the problems begin. We don't want the reputation of renewable energy um, in these parts of the world to become uh, one that has a neo-colonial representation, uh, which is unfortunately what seems to be just starting now. And you have you know, Europe thinking about taking the Sahara for all of its energy and things like this, which um, you know, 
you have to engage the, the, the people that live in these places where these infrastructures are going to be installed. And we have to stop um, looking at this first world versus third world. And we need to start flipping that paradigm and understanding that there's a lot of value that can be gained from understanding these cultures and what impact that will have on the design of energy systems for those places so that we can look at uh, our world as the high carbon world and, and that world as the low carbon world and flip the value judgment that's being made in that language. And in, in this project specifically, um, the Maasai um, women artisans are actually helping to design these, these, these small wearables and small modules that are um, being or ornamented with the beadwork that they create. And the idea is that they could actually have a place on the international market. Um, I would want to buy a Maasai solar module that I can take camping, for example, or have for any other use. And then that income can come back to that community directly and sort of help create a sustainable economic model out of the international renewable energy um, revolution rather than have the, this, this transition be just completely negative impact on the lives of these folks. We have a report on our website on the Maasai Solar tab uh, that, you know, I don't remember the group now. It was, I think it's an NGO that worked with um, indigenous groups in, um, uh, in the Kenya area. Um, and it really talks about there are case studies and interviews that will take you through some of the problematics of these installations. So if it's at all interesting, I would encourage you to go to our website and find that report um, that will be on the Messiah Solar webpage. Um, and of course, these beautiful images that come in from our competitions really lend themselves to uh, very esteemed programming. So our uh, flashcards, Art and Energy flashcards that you see in the center are dual language, Danish and English, um, because they were done during our Loggy 2014 project, um, where we use the submissions themselves to help teach um, young people about the renewable energy technologies, the science, the math behind it, but at the same time really understanding uh, the cultural and aesthetic uh, sensibility behind them. We do publications for every competition. Uh, we're very fortunate to have major publishers that we work with. And uh, we create infographics and do a wide range of programming. Everything except for the publications are free and available to anyone on our website. Um, and we'll end there so that we can have a few minutes to have a conversation. Thanks. Thank Yeah, it's a. I, I would like to think that this is the sort of thing that um, from this scale can actually, within the next 50 years, to be uh, uh, also available at the scale of one's own front yard. Yeah. So, love this question and the way you're looking at it because that's exactly how we look at it. We see that there's the potential for a sort of catalog that comes out of uh, maybe 10 of our. Uh, favorite submissions that are really pragmatic but can be scaled to, you know, to, uh, in front of a corporate headquarters or scaled for someone's backyard. That's exactly right. Um, in our design guideline document, we are very clear that the intellectual property stays with the team. Um, that's the most important to us is that teams feel comfortable submitting to our competition. Um, and then every project, so there are a few projects that we're moving forward on right now that really would be in this realm that you're talking about of scaling down and potentially being replicated around the world. So every project, uh, we will enter into contracts with the team um, 
to make sure that everyone feels that their intellectual property is protected um, the way that they need it to be. And these publications are a document, a record of the, the ideas. So they come out the year of the competition, and the teams are you know, very well credited for all, all of the designs. And, and should there ever be any future, um, they, they have this as a record. Um, we're not helping them go through the actual formal intellectual property um, protection process, whether that be patenting or whatever. Um, but for many of the teams that submit, that's a prohibitive process. So this actually helps record their idea in time uh, in a way. And we're very, uh, we feel very strongly about protecting that. The, the level of detail in these publications is sufficient to, to provide somebody confidence that the actual real team put this thing together and the, the level of detail and description that uh, and then so if somebody really wanted to build it, let's say, and take that project to that, uh, then of course they would work with the team and exactly. the necessary yes. right. arrangements and who gets what and how much work. Yeah, and in, in the case so where the... Like almost gives them profile, right? The yeah, and many of the teams are um, still at university um, and we would um, assist in the future stages with connecting them, putting out the, the, the bid for the detailed design services. We have very good relationships with companies like AECOM, we have a board member. And so there's kind of a standing uh, understanding that, um, that whatever outside um, expertise would need to be added to the team, uh, we would help to facilitate that process. Um, and yeah, the, we have a couple books here, so you can see the level of detail. We try to put as many diagrams in the publication as we possibly can. Um, and they're all done to a concept level of detail. So, and, and the process of detailed design would most certainly somewhat alter the final aesthetic result. Um, and, but the team would be at the helm of that, of all of those creative decisions along the way. From this competition, sorry to do uh, How many, uh, are there any real projects out there like real big? In detail design, so we have, like we have. Well, right now, <laughs> yeah. we have three actually. So uh, it's quite possible that within um, a year, you're going to see uh, an outcome from our Loggy 2010 competition. We can't go into details, we wish we could. Um, and then within two years, an outcome from the 2014 competition for a different site, so. Mm -hmm. And while there are designs for sites uh, that they're specifically designed for sites as a part of the brief, they are very easily adaptable to similar sites or other contexts or scalable. So um, we're, we are in communications with developers and cities who see value in a project and want to bring that team in to design for their site. Um, and, and again, in, in the process of which it may evolve. We also didn't mention that another model that we work in is an invited competition model. Um, so you saw our international design competitions. You saw a, just a couple examples of our participatory design workshop type model. Um, but we're also brought in Glasgow, uh, Scotland, and Connecticut, US are a couple examples where um, it's, there's a desire to hold a competition, um, but to move towards construction rather than having um, you know, it open to the world and open to scale, uh, a site that's uh, where there's going to be development anyhow, um, but they know that they want local talent to be involved. So we've put out a couple invited competitions, and those are projects that are moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Do your magic. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, Loggy 2018, um, that has been expressed desire. So that's possible that a next stage we can't have those conversations right now in Australia because they're in a 
um, an election cycle, so there can't be any conversations. It's, uh, our partners are with the state of Victoria, but yes. And also we can tell you that Loggy 2020 um, will have built outcomes, built uh, functional prototypes. Um, and it'll be an expanded brief, actually, 2020. It'll be more, uh, we'll address energy, water, um, composting, shelter, and agriculture, all in the design brief and with built outcomes the next year. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, we started, when we started the project, we were excited and anxious and we wanted to just get going. So we've been holding it as ideas competitions because that's very safe. You know, no one has to commit to anything that they don't know is coming. Um, but now as cities bring us in, uh, they're asking for us to, um, to work towards construction. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we haven't had a site and design brief specifically around that, um, the idea of forestry, but it's been something that we have been thinking about. Um, we had a conversation with um, Sage Hanfield Lab um, folks about looking at their site, and they're in the um, eastern slopes of the Sierras in, in the western US. Um, we are really interested in the idea of agrivoltaics and um, all shared land use is a big underlying theme for all of, our, of the ideas that inspire us because whether that's uh, recreation for people and a placemaking approach to, for shared land use with, with energy landscapes or whether that's um, food production or whether that's forestry. I think that these are the kind of solutions we need to be thinking about um, because the land use requirements for a 100% renewable energy future are significant and we're going to have to be creative about how we merge those land uses together in a way so that we can conserve in a 100% natural way much of the land area that we need to conserve. So that, absolutely. If you have any ideas for competition along those lines, let us know. <laughs> Certainly. Yeah, there, there are some agrivoltaic solutions that are opaque panels, uh, but their spacing is such that it allows light through in a way that allows sufficient um, for production underneath. And I think it's very dependent on the region and the local climate, what your answer to that is. In, in certain places that um, basically you're, you're altering the microclimate underneath the panel in a place that is intensely arid and, and hot, then you may actually be um, bringing that uh, to be matching a more northerly latitude by placing the panels above it. So it can be very sim um, symbiotic in a way, um, but if you're, uh, every site's different, I guess is the answer to that. Yeah, in that case, um, you may need to have less uh, light blocking, um, allow more through. Let me make an observation. You touched upon it. This conflict, land use issues, and, and how we can begin to think in a constructive way uh, about uh, to at least diffuse those conflicts. One thing that uh, emerged for me fairly recently was I have a mentoring a student in Kenya. His PhD thesis turns out to be on the subject local public opposition to wind power generation in Kenya. Mm. So they are in essence replicating similarly the model we did here in Ontario. Some of you may remember the opposition to wind um, the wind installation in Southwest Ontario is much better side nuclear power plants than you could be a wind power plant. That's a level of opposition. So these are 
large industrial scale classical wind wind facilities and they engender the same degree of opposition or a similar degree of opposition as in, I thought it was a problem just of our world here you know, in my backyard kind of thing. Oh, it's global. It surfaced. And to me it was a surprise. It's even in Denmark. In Kenya. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I'd love to hear or read his thoughts and the results of his paper um, because I wonder if, um, in speaking from what we witnessed there, my question would be around what the pushback is, what the reasoning is for. So in Denmark, when we were working there, where it's you know very rich in wind turbines, there was pushback. So there were headlines when we were working there uh, about a bit of land where they wanted to bring in some installations, but of course that was wealthier landowners and they said no. So that's the pushback in Denmark is by wealthy landowners, but what's the pushback in Kenya? I'd be really curious to see if, uh, is, it, is it aesthetics? Is it um, because who's, who is and who isn't benefiting from that? Um, so I, I'd love to know more about that. And I have my speculations, but would love to know so, more. So Uda is doing those studies and trying to understand the nature of the community mm -hmm. positions in the survey stage. But it emerges the early insight, which is similar to his, his comes in a developer and says, okay, I'm gonna build you know, 30 tall turbines here and on this land. And, and where is this all going to? Someplace else, right? Right. So really an industrial scale, large yep. uh, power generator, although it happens to be wind turbines uh, over a certain area. But it, the dynamic is still the same. Yeah. Yeah. That's where I see the potential for, I mean, I'm truly excited by the stuff that you do, is can we find a way to diffuse those conflicts yeah. and advance this thing? But, but I think that uh, a key to that is community engagement or user engagement. If you don't want to, because well, who's the community is always a question, but user engagement. And this was really, again, the takeaway from the conference we were at at Arizona State University that was titled Eradicating Poverty Through Energy Innovation, um, was that you know, you have to talk to the user before coming in with these installations. It's that simple, yet something so simple is not done. People don't engage with the community. And it may be a, an opportunity to rethink how power purchase agreements are negotiated because, um, you know, one of the things that has come to the fore in the design of cities and developments is 1% for the arts. So uh, you're required as a developer to give 1% uh, to the back to the public realm, and, um, and what if we had a one percent for the arts for energy installations, where um, there was an opportunity to br take that one percent, which for large scale installations can be a significant pot of money, uh, enough certainly to engage the community, and maybe there's also one percent of the of the energy output. So if it's a power purchase agreement with a utility or with a, a, a company like Microsoft. Um, maybe 99% of that is Microsoft's power to feed their data center, but 1% is actually a, a give back to the people that surround that wind farm who now feel like they're a stakeholder. They're actually benefiting. They can, you know, even though it's a small amount, it's something and it's, it's engaging them with the investment in the future, not only for themselves, but for the planet. Thank you. Uh, walking us through it. Uh, I've, see, I've, I've heard your story before, but it's always been a fast, quick pace. I picked up a few new ideas as you got a little chance to talk through uh, some details. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks and we'll do it again us. tonight. Uh, we'll do yeah. It again, uh, public library, come back again and listen to the same story. Uh, we'll try and change it up. <laughs> we won't. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.